better in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, April 10, 2024. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Jeremy Kimbrell, measurement machine operator at the Mercedes-Benz plants in Vance, Alabama, member of the volunteer organizing committee, the UAW at that plant. Then Terry Gerstein, director of the Wagner Labor Initiative at New York University on the state of child labor in this country. Meanwhile, a day after Donald Trump says states can totally ban abortion, Arizona does. And does it with an 1864 pre-statehood law. Also on the program, IDF minister tells the U.S. Secretary of Defense, actually, there's no date set for the Rafah attack. As Biden calls Bibi's handling of the war a mistake oh a whoopsie an oopsie whoopsie made a wrong turn meanwhile biden planning a trump-like lockdown at our southern border inflation rises more than expected driven largely by housing costs the biden epa imposes the first ever national drinking water limits on Forever Chemicals, PFAS. The Biden USDA ups allotment of cash uh, equivalent assistance for fruit and veggies for WIC participants. The FAA investigating claims from a new Boeing whistleblower. The Senate plans a hearing. And longtime listeners will remember the names Jack Burkham and Jacob Wall. The loony Republican operatives fined $1.25 million for setting up robocalls in 2020 to suppress the black vote. And as the RFK a Junior New York campaign director turns out to be a January 6th Stop the Steal rally attendee, Cornell West about to announce his running mate today. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It is Hump Day. Word. Oh, it's Hump Day. You didn't. You didn't. You didn't wait for my cue. Ah, dang it! Dang it! I'm sorry. That's all I right. Got... Sometimes I mean uh, Emma almost started saying this yesterday, so she's really uh, uh, gearing up for it. Well, look, um, I just, I'm so eager to get that royalty check. Yes. No, understood. We've got a lot to get to today. Um, this uh, this uh, late breaking, it happened actually during the show yesterday. The Arizona Supreme Court, I think it was a five to two decision, if Four I'm not two. mistaken. One Four to two. Abstention. Uh, one abstention, exactly. Seven members of this uh, seven-member court were appointed by Republican uh, governors. And they have found that a law that is 160 years old, written before Arizona became a state. Now, to be fair, it was recodified in 1912, I think it was, when uh, Arizona joined uh, the union but the Arizona State uh, Court upheld this 160-year-old uh, law that bans abortions and uh, jails doctors who provides them. Now, in 2021, my understanding is that the state legislature 
rolled back a uh, part of that law uh, that it would have also put a woman in prison for a year. And, insane. Well, actually, the well, the insane part of that is like, why would you let the woman get off the hook? Right. I mean, if you believe that doctors should be jailed for providing an abortion, uh, how would you not implicate uh, the the woman who was seeking an abortion? I mean, uh, even even when it was recodified in 1912, we should say. Both times this legislation was re-upped or upped, women didn't have the right to vote at this time. That's true. <laughs> so yes. these are these uh, these were passed and then reaffirmed before women had suffrage. Um, and uh, in 2022, following the uh, or I should say prior to the Dobbs decision, the Arizona uh, legislature passed a 15 week abortion. And the court read that 15-week abortion as being, uh, the 15-week abortion ban being essentially, if you break that, extra bad. So it was like a larded on top of the no abortion. Um, so the majority ruled that the law passed by the Arizona legislature in 2022 uh, did not repeal the pre-statehood law, nor create a right to abortion, uh, it only basically um, said that additional criminal and regulatory sanctions may apply to abortions performed after 15 weeks gestation. So it basically just said, uh, presumably was just a way in which people be more uh, punished for that. Um, this is obviously going to have massive uh, implications in Arizona, but it also shows, I think, why Donald Trump's uh, position on abortion um, despite the fact that he pretended it was, you know, I guess just a, a function of, um, of, uh, allowing people to maintain abortion rights in states that, uh, choose to do so is that it allows for laws that were written in 1864, uh, to become law of the land laws, like you say, Emma, that were written when, uh, women didn't even have the right to vote mm -hmm. in this country but they uh, did have the right to be subjected to uh, men saying that you don't have control over your own bodies. Um, and uh, this is also going to have huge implications for Arizona, which is a swing state and a big uh, Senate race there because um, abortion uh, rights advocates had already been working on a petition to put the question of abortion rights on the ballot to add to the Arizona constitution, they have already uh, found, or I should say collected 500,000 signatures out of the 384,000 that they need to get on the ballot. The deadlines in uh, July, what will be really interesting is to see how many more hundreds of thousands of more, they will get to sign on to this in the next April, May, June, you know, three months. Yeah. And um, what's it really going to, it's going to have big implications in terms of the presidential election, theoretically, because a lot of those people are going to come out who are in favor of abortion rights and newsflash, the Republican party is not. Yep. And the Republican Party has had a plank to the extent it has put out a, uh, you know, a uh, platform. Last time it didn't, it just said we like Donald Trump. But the Republican Party has always had a plank basically saying we need to repeal Roe v. Wade. And you repeal Roe v. Wade because you want to ban abortion. You want to say that women do not have a right to an abortion, and that gives us the opportunity to ban it. And now Arizona has done that. Here is um, uh, Carrie Lake, who is running against uh, Ruben Gallego. And she uh, issued a strong statement Whoa. in opposition to the Arizona Supreme Court ruling on abortion. Here it is. Pop this up. Uh, can you read that uh, better? Yeah. Than in addition to covering the state of Arizona as a fair and honest journalist for 27 years, I have traveled to every corner of the state on the campaign trail. 
I speak to more Arizonans than anyone, and it is abundantly clear that the pre-statehood law is out of step with Arizonans. I am the only woman and mother in this race. I understand the fear and anxiety of pregnancy and the joy of motherhood. I wholeheartedly agree with President Trump. This is a very personal issue that should be determined by each individual state and her people. I oppose today's ruling, and I am calling on Katie Hobbs and the state legislature to come up with an Im immediate common sense solution that Arizonans can support. Uh, ultimately, Arizona voters will make the decision on the ballot come November. That's very true. I'm sure that she would prefer Katie Hobbs to address this via the state legislature before the election as opposed to it going to the polls because their last poll that was done by the New York Times in October found that 59 percent of Arizona registered voters um, support abortion either always or mostly compared to 34 percent who say it should be mostly or always illegal. These are broadly popular rights in the country and in the state of Arizona. Now, What's interesting, there's two things I find interesting about this. One is that Carrie Lake has been saying up until very recently that she was, in fact, uh, I think the governor of of right. Arizona, uh, <laughs> that uh, somehow Katie Hobbs was just, uh, you know, got in by some Imposter. type of fraud. Or, or yes. yeah, she was, um, maybe the, the servers were acid, acid washed and uh, she wasn't uh, really governor. And then the other weird thing is, is that, now, I don't know if people, uh, we've got a lot of young people who uh, watch this program, so I'm not sure uh, how many people were uh, who watch this program were alive in 2022, because that was <laughs> so long ago. Um, but back in 2022, I know I sound like an old man talking about this, but uh, we had uh, things called debates. And um, back in 2022, Carrie Lake when she was just a young pup um, who had no life experience as opposed to today in early 2024. <laughs> um, this is what she had to say in her debate against um, uh, Katie Hobbs. Uh, she's being questioned by PBS Arizona's Ted Simons about this very question. Interesting. Uh, Carrie, we'll start with you on this one. Uh, the new law banning abortion, well, the new law banning abortion in Arizona after 15 weeks. There's that law, and there's a territorial era law which bans all abortion. Zippo, over. Mm -hmm. Which law do you think should take effect? My personal belief is that all life matters, all life counts, and all life is precious, and I don't believe in abortion. I think the older law is going to take a, is going to go into effect that's what i believe will happen okay but and but you approve of that uh, uh, what at, at conception i believe life begins at conception okay what do we do about abortion pills what do we do about i uh, don't think abortion pills should be legal that's in, a very not in arizona thing. karen what do you think that's uh, now clear. i got to apologize i thought that was the uh, katie hobbs this is actually the republican primary so to be fair it was almost 3 or 4 months before uh, he, she debated uh, Katie Hobbs. But uh, there it is, folks. I mean, she has done a 180-degree turn from where she was, was it Was it two years ago? A little bit less. Let's go, let's, you know. Duh. Be fair to her and say two years. Let's, yes. Now, right. I know that's a long, long time ago. Uh, if you were two years old, you'd be four years old today. Yeah. She uh, she she knows that democracy on this front is not her friend, right? I mean, that's what all of these anti-abortion advocates understand. That's why they spent so much time uh, basically stacking the courts with people in their favor. They th these are these zombie statutes. I've I've heard abortion advocates refer to them as these ancient statutes that they're being revived. That are being revived because direct democracy is all it, it, people are not in favor of this. So they have to go to these old laws, like the Comstock Act is the other one that's now endorsed by the Heritage Foundation, an anti obscenity law on the from the federal level from the 1870s uh, in order to restrict mifepristone and abortion pills from going through the mail. So because they can't actually address the American public and what they want, they have to go to the 1800s before yeah. women had the right to vote, before, you know, I mean, this That's was true. a Civil War but era law. So the, they, the democracy is a threat to this. Yes, but here's the thing. There's a reason why 
the uh, that law is still on the books as opposed to the part of the law that said a woman go, goes to jail for a year. There's a reason why that law stays on the books and sends doctors to prison is because the Republican Party has controlled that legislature yeah. and does not want to repeal it. And that's why Carrie Lake, when she ran for the uh, for for uh, the governor, wins her primary by saying, I don't care about the 2022 uh, law or uh, 20, you know, the 2022 law that's just been passed. We got to go back to the original one because I believe that life starts at conception. So no abortion, no circumstances, never. That's what Carrie Lake actually wants. No morning and, after pill, maybe. No morning at. I, I mean, listen, uh, well, that's arguable. Right. But, I mean, th- it depends on where they decide conception actually begins. Mm-hmm. I, would, I would bet that many of them say conception begins as soon as um, copulation starts. Right. And uh, sometimes it catches, sometimes it doesn't, because then you're starting to get into science. And it's really mm-hmm. just a question of God's will at any point anyways. But the fact of the matter is, this is the Republican position. And they can say that they have a different position, but there is absolutely no reason to believe that when they were in power, they would not be voting for this. But we will uh, talk more about this as the show progresses. In a moment, we're going to be talking to Jeremy Kimbrell. Uh, He is a measurement machine operator at Mercedes-Benz plants in Vance, Alabama. He is a member of the volunteer organizing committee uh, for the UAW at the plant. And they're about to, um, or they just announced what was it? What was it a week ago? Uh, I don't even know what day today is. Less than a week ago that I think it's close to 70% of the workers in that plant have signed a, uh, a card uh, requesting an election. And so uh, we're going to see an election there as well as it's a second plant, of course. Uh, the Tennessee VW plant is going to have an election in, I think, about a week. Uh, but we will be talking to him in a moment. We got some uh, sponsors today. These are easy ones for me to do because I use all of these products. In fact, um, I was using fast growing trees well before they started to uh, advertise with us. Uh, Fastgrowingtrees.com, it is the biggest online nursery in the US. It has more than 10,000 different kinds of plants and over 2 million happy customers in the US. Now is the time, and I'm speaking zone five, but I imagine you could do it even in you know uh, in warmer climates. Uh, now is the time to get your your trees, your plants in the ground outside, and it's always good to put plants inside. I have grown with fast growing trees. I have planted uh, Hosea uh, 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 Korean uh, pear trees, and I've gotten pears the next year. I've uh, I've planted Arkansas black apple trees. I've uh, I've done uh, uh, honey crisp. Of course, you got to. Um, uh, I've, I've done bloomerangs, these, uh, lilacs that come, that, that bloom, uh, once in the spring and then once in like July. And the beauty of, uh, fast growing trees is that, I don't know if they grow faster, but they, they ship them bigger. And so you start to see uh, growth, um, the next year, you don't have to have a yard also. You can grow a lemon tree, an avocado tree, olive tree, fig tree inside your home. The experts at Fast Growing Trees curate thousands of plants so you can find the perfect fit for your specific climate, your location, and your needs. You don't have to drive around to nurseries. You don't have to bend the uh, tree or the, uh, have the plants uh, dump in the back of your car. Fast Growing Trees makes it easy to order online. Your plants are shipped to your doors in one to two days. If you're looking to add privacy or shade or natural beauty or fruit, Fast Growing Trees has in-house experts ready to help you make the right selection with growing and care advice available. You ready for this? 24-7. That means all the time. You can talk to a plant expert about your soil type, your landscape design, how to take care of your plants, everything else you need. No green thumb required. Spring have the best deals online, up to half off on, on select plants and other deals. Listeners to our show get an additional 15% off their first purchase using the code majority at checkout. That's an additional 15% off at fastgrowingtrees.com using the code majority at checkout, fastgrowingtrees.com, code majority, 
Offer valid for a limited time. Terms and conditions may apply. And then this uh, um, next one, super easy. Springtime. I don't, I don't even have to say anything because every day, every day, I'm, uh, I am drinking my liquid IV. A single stick of liquid IV makes ordinary hydration extraordinary. Three times the electrolytes of the leading sports drink, plus eight vitamins and nutrients for everyday wellness. I went uh, to, to Vegas, um, what was it, last week? For that uh, for the yeah. tour conference, wow! I bring yeah. uh, half a dozen sticks of uh, liquid IV. I drink it during the show. I drink it uh, on the plane. I drink it when I get off the plane. I have no dehydration. I'm doing great. Um, maybe I, you know, overindulge helps. Uh, you know, helps with that uh, before and after. Um, liquid IV is the number one powered hydration uh, powdered hydration brand in America. Like I say, three times the electrolytes are the leading sports drink. Uh, now you can tear, pour, and live more. One stick, 16 ounces of water hydrates better than water alone. Liquid IV contains eight vitamins and nutrients, non-GMO, free from gluten, free from dairy, free from soy, no artificial colors or sweeteners. And now there are four, not just three, but now there are four sugar-free flavors. White peach, green grape, raspberry melon, lemon lime. And I would suggest the lemon lime and the raspberry melon. Raspberry melon's new. Fantastic. Zero sugar hydration solution with no artificial sweeteners. Clinically tested to hydrate more than water alone. Turn your ordinary water into extraordinary hydration with Liquid IV. Get 20% off your first order of Liquid IV. When you go to liquidiv.com, use the code Majority Rep, not Majority Report. Majority rep at checkout. That's 20% off your first order when you shop better hydration today using promo code majority rep at liquidiv.com. Thank you, Liquid IV, for your support and for keeping me hydrated every single day. And lastly, uh, last sponsor of the day, when uh, I started podcasting, I never knew that, uh, and frankly, when I started radio, I never knew that I would be here. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. 20 years later. Wow. There it is. This is a 20-year commemorative uh, Majority Report uh, mug. And how do I sell this? Well, for a long time, I was like, I'm not doing merch because I have no idea how to do that. I don't know how to take the money. I don't know how to ship it out. I don't know how to get the, I don't know how to coordinate my sales if we ever do a live show. And then Shopify, well, it probably already existed. I don't think it was invented. But uh we got an idea for a posit collar, uh, you know, for our dog. Yes. Well, you can put it up on Shopify. From the uh, launcher online shop stage to the real life uh, store stage, all the way to the, did we just hit a million orders stage, which we almost did on these mugs. <laughs> these uh, 20 year majority report mugs, not quite. Um, but it doesn't matter. Shopify is there to help you grow. It doesn't matter whether you're selling scented soap, offering outdoor outfits, or I don't know. Um, mugs, t-shirts, hats. Shopify helps you sell everywhere from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person point of sale system. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify has got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the entire United States. Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds uh, all and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial at shopify.com slash majority, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash majority right now to grow your business. No matter what stage you're in, shopify.com slash majority. All right, quick break. And we'll be talking to Jeremy Kimbrell. He is a uh, member of the volunteer organizing committee at the Mercedes Benz plant in Vance, Alabama. And they're about to have, or they're, they've just filed with the uh, national labor relations board for a vote. And this is a, uh, this is big stuff. This is a big deal the South could start to see um, some unionization at their uh, car factories. We'll be right back.
We're back. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Joining us now, Jeremy Kimbrell. He's a measurement machine operator at the Mercedes-Benz plants in Vance, Alabama, a member of the Volunteer Organizing Committee at the plant. Uh, Jeremy, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Thank y'all for having me. So, uh, Jeremy, um, walk us through this. I mean, uh, there's going to be a vote. Uh, I think it's April 17th in Tennessee, and it's going to be like a three-day vote. So uh, you guys would be the second, um, uh, at least this year anyways, to take a vote. But walk us through the history of 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 the organizing that you've done in, in Alabama at the, uh, uh, at this Vance plant and how many workers are there? Um, uh, just give us a little bit of background on that. Yeah. So there's a little bit over 5,000 workers there that are full time. Um, I have been involved in multiple union campaigns over the years and all of them came up short. Um, whether the time just wasn't right, or, um, you know, sometimes it wasn't a very good campaign, but we always had a marginal argument to make. And of course, uh, this campaign is different. Um, times are different. And UAW has got a, got a new president and a new administration with new strategies. And with our situation on the ground at Mercedes and then the changes at the UAW, everything just came together and made it the, the right time. Give us a sense of how the campaign is is different this time around. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, uh, uh, I, I think folks have a sense of 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 how Sean Fain is different and 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 that we're in a, just a different era uh, coming out of COVID. People are a lot more sort of uh, dissatisfied and and realizing the value of unions. But how is uh, how has your strategy changed or your tactics changed? You can really summarize it with saying worker led. Um, all campaigns before, we were kind of uh, given pretty much strict instructions of how to conduct the campaign and specific benchmarks that were almost etched in stone. And this time, it's been much more worker-led. Uh, the workers have led it inside the plant. The ideas from the workers um, were, were utilized uh, with some adaptations. So when the workers are the ones making it happen, they're a lot more bought in. So that's that's absolutely the biggest difference from past campaigns. How um, we got a lot of people who who listen to the show who have wanted to organize their uh, workplace or have worked uh, organized their workplace. So, like when you get the essentially the license, forgive I guess sort of the pun, uh, cars. Um, <laughs> when you get the license to to uh, basically take it into your own hands as a worker, like you know what's best, what's going on there, how to develop these relationships with the other workers. Like, give us a little sense of what you do. Like, how, do you are are you do you build on people you know who are interested in the union and then slowly expand out from that? Like, how do you go about organizing that thing? Yeah, you pretty much have it right. So you got to have relationships to start with. Um, and, and once those relationships are made, you keep those contacts for could be years. Uh, actually, at our plant, we had a campaign um, about two years ago that it was a failed campaign. But we made a lot of contacts then that we didn't have before because uh, we had so many new workers. Uh, our turnover has been pretty high the last several years. So a lot of workers uh, that, that we met doing handbills. Or, or walking the plants were new we, and we took those contacts and um, you know we just took off with it. It, it went real fast because we all already had at least some relationship and then we capitalized on those relationships and, and grew it bigger. What um, uh, so how many workers are we talking about and and um, are they all in this uh, unit and um, and how many have signed a uh, a card, uh, basically that that gets sent on to the National Labor Relations Board to signify that, yeah, we're ready for an election. Yeah. So um, as far as card signings is in the fight, we're counting it in the in the thousands. Um, but our our number that we started with was about twenty. Uh, I invited about twenty people uh, on a call to talk to the UAW and decide if that's the direction we wanted to go. We definitely knew we were gonna run an organizing campaign, but you know, over the years, we've 
we've had a relationship with the UAW we wouldn't really satisfied with uh, just because they, you know, we already have a boss at work. We didn't want a boss while we're trying to unionize the, the plant. We wanted somebody to work with us. So um, once we had that meeting, the workers were ready, started with about 20 and just went from there. So, you know, um, our organizing committee is in the, in the hundreds. Uh, it's across the whole plant. It's extremely diverse, diverse in, in age, gender, race, seniority. So that's why we feel pretty good. We've got, we've got all the areas covered. And speaking of your bosses, what, what was their react? What has been their reaction, uh, management or your bosses? And how does that differ from the previous times that, that you spoke about? Yeah, so some of the campaigns we've had in the past, um, they, they fought back pretty hard. Uh, sometimes they've just ignored us. Uh, they didn't really do anything two years ago except put out one um, one statement, I guess you'd say, from the, from the upper management. Um, that was pretty much it. And so when we started this time, uh, actually a lot of the management was supportive of us. Um, they, they knew that things weren't good. They were supportive of us, but I don't. I think because we failed so many times, they didn't really think we'd be successful. And though, so so the more successful we got, um, you know, things got real for them. And then they just absolutely, all of a sudden, it was like, no, we're not. Y'all, y'all don't need a union in here, and and we're gonna we're gonna do a, a extremely active campaign to put it down. And that's been from the top guy to plant all the way down to the lowest supervisors. With very few exceptions, they're all in tandem uh, trying to put it down. We, I think we played that uh, video of of this the the instances where they were right. uh, mandatory meetings and and, uh, and talking down the union. How like, I mean, I imagine for them it's not that awkward, but I would imagine there's also a certain amount of awkwardness because this is a German company. Um, they in in Germany, they the union members sit on the board. How do they reconcile that? Or, or do they get a lot of like, well, this is America. It's exactly what you just said. It's, this is America. Um, they treat us totally different from how they do uh, the plants in Germany and even around the world. Uh, the Germans that come over and work at our plant tell us y'all are absolutely crazy to put up with this stuff. Uh, it would never it would never be tolerated in Germany. Y'all need to do something. So uh, they they don't get it. They you know they just accept that. Yeah, y'all Americans just do it differently, and we tell them no. It ain't that we want it differently. It's that that our laws over here allow the companies to to do us like they do. Do they? Uh, I, I I mean, are you getting? Um, I mean, obviously they come over, they check it out. You're having these conversations. Is there any type of like uh, material support they provide, or they provide you with with strategies or tactics, or is it um, is it just moral support, or uh, wh- what do you hear from those workers? It's primarily a, a moral support. Uh, there's nothing actively that in, that any individual German can do. Uh, we do have the backing of the Iggy Metall Union and also the Works Councils over in Germany. Um, they've written letters uh, directly to our management, but so far it's it's not rendered any any change. Um, they've had a captive audience meeting as lately as this morning, so there's been no change. Um, the uh, so. You guys have hit at least 70% of uh, card signatures. Is that right? Uh, you know, exact percentages, I wouldn't want to talk too much about. Fair but enough. I would just say, you know, the, the majority is not in question. It's a it's a sweet majority, uh, even in, even in uh, signatures and support. Um, everybody in the plant believes that the union is going to come in. Uh, even the management believes it. So it's like no surprise. The, the people that's worked in this plant for years, um, you know, the thing that they say is uh, Mercedes has done it to themselves from going to two tier pay in 2020 with no reason. Um, profits were through the roof. It was just greed. Um, and, and, you know, terrible. Our insurance gets worse. They locked us in all those years without raises and then put us on shifts we didn't want. So, uh, you know, you just you add it all together and, and no one's surprised uh, by what's happening on the ground. What. Um, uh, so 
you you guys have also filed uh, at least a couple of uh, ULPs on flair uh, labor practice uh, notices with the National Labor Relations Board and also one with the German government. Uh, 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 claiming that Mercedes has broken uh, German law in the way that they're uh, treating uh, the, the the response to the desire to unionize in this country. Um, what are the implications of those filings, um, both on the German front, but on the U.S. front? Because um, I, I, I I'm unclear how the Semex ruling uh, that took place at the end of uh, last of 2023. Um, which basically said, you know, once there's uh, cards uh, filed, uh, the management's got two weeks and uh, any type of unfair labor practices at that point, automatically, basically, uh, you're getting a union. Um, where, wh- what are the implications of both those filings? Yeah, so uh, when it comes to the unfair labor practice charges, um, our laws over here in the United States are absolutely terrible. Uh, an American citizen, a person that works, uh, works hourly should, should just really learn how weak our laws are and be outraged about it. So while we file those, those labor practice charges and they are terrible, um, just a terrible example of how a human being should treat another, uh, those will be months playing out. Um, as far as the charges in Germany, um, those, Mercedes is without a doubt in violation of their uh, commitments as a company, but more than that, uh, they're violating German law, which requires uh, all German headquartered companies to be be neutral in any active union campaign worldwide. But there again, you know, this is the United States, and they feel like this is this is to be exempted. So we're hoping that bringing all this public will cause other entities, other than us, just in Alabama, to exert pressure. And hopefully the company uh, will decide to be neutral. Um, as far as uh, you know, bringing the election to a vote—that's another thing in the United States. Um, you know, the the NLRB handles that, and uh, you know they have hearings and determinations. So uh, my understanding is now they're they're working together to uh, set the rules up for the election, and then we'll determine the exact size of the bargaining unit, which the company has influence over that it's not cut and dried they don't just give the workers a list you have to actually file for an election before you get the actual list so we don't exactly know when our vote will be but we expect within about a month um and we hope we hope through all that we're doing that the company will just uh, finally uh be neutral because the only only thing that they do now that's neutral is at the end of their long anti-union speeches they say it's your choice <laughs> that's the only only neutral thing that they say is there any other, uh, how many other, uh, are there any other, or how many other um, uh, uh, Mercedes plants are there in the country? There's one other in South Carolina, and uh, those, our plant and that plant, which is a van plant, are the only two uh, Mercedes companies in the world that are not represented by collective bargaining. Um I imagine uh, you guys have had conversations maybe with some of your uh, your colleagues at uh, in, in South Carolina. I imagine you don't want to talk too much about that. Uh, but um, are you encouraged? Can you say any can you say anything that gives me an indication of like, is there a future at South Carolina too? Or something like this? Once we have our union in Alabama at the Mercedes Benz plant, I think you can look for all plants to get ready because I think that'll be the cue for workers that if Mercedes and Alabama can stand together, the workers even in Alabama can stand together, uh, together and form their union uh, and get their fair share than anybody anywhere, any blue collar worker in the country can get their union too. What can, uh, what can our listeners do to help support you guys? You know, if you're, if, if you're a union supporter or a union member, just let people know that you're behind them, that, uh, you know, in, in my area of the country, sometimes uh, people consider unions taboo. And so so what I plan to do is we actually have quite a lot of union workers uh, in, in our area. And I feel like maybe sometimes they don't uh, they don't talk enough publicly about how good a union has been for their jobs and their careers. So just tell somebody union jobs are good jobs. 
and you need to get behind workers who want to uh, who want to better their lives and protect themselves. Jeremy Kimbrell, uh, measurement machine operator at the Mercedes-Benz plant in Vance, Alabama, a uh, member of the volunteer organizing committee at the plant. Thanks so much for your time today. Good luck. Uh, and uh, we'll check in with you hopefully after you guys um, are on the other side of this election and have won it. Really appreciate your time today. I'll be ready. Thank you. All right. Thanks great. So Thank you. All right. We're going to take a, a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to be talking to Terry Gerstein director of the Wagner Labor Initiative at uh, NYU on the, um, the uh, we've seen about, I don't know, 30 states change their laws in terms of a child labor. Some for the better, some for the worse. Mm. Uh, but something is happening out there in terms of child labor. And we'll be right back uh, and talk to her more about this. Right. <laughs> We are back, Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Want to welcome to the program Terry Gerstein, director of the Wagner Labor Initiative at New York University. Terry, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, <clears throat> I saw a uh, uh, piece in the Washington Post uh, two weeks ago by uh, Lauren Kaori Gurley uh, entitled, America is div uh, divided over major efforts to rewrite uh, child labor laws. And we've been um, tracking this over the past couple of years, particularly in post-COVID. Um, the there are laws that uh, aim to strengthen uh, uh, child labor laws. When we hear about, you know, maybe uh, a kid getting killed uh, doing roofing or at a meat processing plant, um, and then there's like a, a, a dozen states, maybe a little more, that are changing their labor laws to allow uh, children to work more. Before we get into that, give us a sense of like what from a federal level, and that seems to be the more or less the basement, or it used to be, I mean, uh, of what we, you know, and states add on to that. But what is the federal law? Like how much, how much can my, I have an 11 year old, um, how much can I put this kid to, uh, you know, starting to bring home some bacon? <laughs> Well, um, so your 11 year old can uh, set the table and keep the room clean, right? But um, our child labor that will laws. will come as news to him, but I will, <laughs> I will tell. So our child labor laws, you're right, there's laws at the federal and at the state level. And basically, the federal law has two main components. And I think you, you implicitly raised a very important point, which is that our laws do allow children to work. Once they're 14, um, there's a whole host of different kinds of jobs that kids can have. What our child labor laws prohibit is work that is either hazardous, like the most dangerous jobs, not just for kids, but for adults, um, children are not allowed to perform. And then also it prohibits children from being assigned to work certain hours. Um, and the reason for that is we don't want to have kids working schedules that are so long that it interferes with their education or their development. 
And so kids who are 14, the, the hazardous, in terms of the hazardous jobs, there's a list um, at the federal level. And then most states also have lists. Sometimes those are more comprehensive than at the federal level and um, cover more types of work or cover entire workplaces instead of specific jobs. And then there are hours limitations, which under federal law for minors who are 16 and up, there aren't any hours limitations, but most states do have those. And then the one additional protection that many states have is that many states also require minors to get a work permit or employment certificate, basically getting permission from the school and from their parents and sort of advising the Department of Labor that they're going to be working and alerting the employer that this child is a minor and therefore special protections apply. Now, I, I, I am uh, in, in, you know, I, I, I'm in uh, very supportive of 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 uh, 14 year olds 15 year olds working i had a job i think starting either 14 or 15 years old it was well before i could drive um but it was you know it was like after school and it was maybe uh, four days a week uh, maybe five but it was no more than three or four hours uh you know uh, a, a, a day and um the but this is this is a whole new thing that we're doing in terms of like what jobs what is, I want to start with the parental uh, notification and the permitting process, because I do distinctly remember having to go get, have my parents sign something uh, saying I was of, of a specific age and that I had permission to work. And it occurs to me when I hear particularly the parental stuff, uh, and, and then when it's like um, uh, re what, uh, changes into like parental notification, and, and then I also see like, an increase in sort of like the hours and the danger that people are associated with. The first thing that comes to mind for me is this is basically a pro trafficking law that this is an attempt by in, in certain, um, you know, areas that may be dominated by like chicken processors. I'm thinking about, you know, Arkansas right now, chicken processors or something like that, that they want immigrant children to be able to work there. And that the lack of a uh, parental permit is more to give cover to the companies for saying, like, we didn't know, uh, you know, how could we possibly know this person was 14, 13, 12 and didn't have parents here? Yeah, I mean, I would be I'm personally a little reluctant to speculate about their their motives, but there certainly are employer associations that have been um, backing these rollbacks and pushing for them, as well as um, the, an organization, the, the, a lobbying group, the Foundation for Government Accountability um, in Florida and other dark money um, groups. You know, I do think that it's very, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of sort of confusion and old rationalizations that are being given for the reason for, um, for rolling back these laws, like in relation to the work permit issue. Um, during the rollback conversations about that, it was rolled back in Arkansas, there was discussion about how like this should be up to parents. And it's so nonsensical because the work permit process requires the minor to get the parent's signature, right? So it's it just is literally does not make sense. Um, and then some of the justifications have been, um, I read recently um, someone's academic um, paper about, you know, the initial restraints on child labor a century ago. And some of the opponents said, well, there'll be children who are idle. And now there's sort of the same thing about like, well, this will get them off of their, their screens. But these changes really do put kids at risk. The work permit process, you know, it, it's often point, you know, painted as just sort of some government bureaucracy. But what the work permit process does is it keeps everyone in a picture alert, the employer, the school, the parents, the, the Department of Labor, that this is a minor and that there are additional protections involved. And in fact, Maine reported that when they got work permit op, uh, applications, a number of them um, were rejected because the work was hazardous. And so in that case, it actually prevented violations. And most of the work permit, the paperwork actually lists the child labor laws on them and the employer, you know, so it actually literally the application process makes everyone involved aware of what the law is and how to find out more. So it really has a preventive feature to it. So cool. there's a preventive feature to all of them. I just, I just want yeah. cause I want to drill down this and I, you know, um, without, I understand you don't want to uh, impart uh, motivations on, on people. 
but do we have data? Like, in other words, do we know, Absolutely. like when you're talking about 14 and 15 and 16 year olds who are working, you know, it's one thing, like I say, I, I worked, I went to the uh, five and dime, literally, I think it was called the five and 10. And, uh, you know, I had clean bathrooms or restock inventory or something like that. That's all well and good. This was not, uh, you know, difficult stuff. But if I'm, you know, working as a roofer or right, if I'm right, working right. around heavy machinery, I mean, do we have statistics on how many 14, 15, 16 year olds are working with parents who are local? You know, when these laws, when they basically are, you know, uh, 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 essentially allowed to work without a permit, and I get that, yes, this this permitting process makes everybody accountable. It adds liability, I bet, for both for, you know, the parents and but particularly the uh, uh, the employer, because they they have to be made aware that there are restrictions on what kind of danger and hours they could put these kids in. But do we have any sense or are we just like are we just completely driving blind here in terms of like who's actually filling these positions when a, a work permit uh gets rescinded or I should say so, repealed. Right. So, um, I mean, who is filling these? So statistics on the increase in violations, I believe the U S department of labor reported like an 88% increase in violations over the past several years. And that includes both hazardous industries, you know, hazardous work as well as hours violations. And then some States have reported that as well. Um, and then the question you asked about, you know, who are doing these jobs, you know, in, in a lot of cases, they are unaccompanied minors, they're immigrant children, they're especially, you know, immigrants are especially vulnerable in general at work because of fear of retaliation, fear of potential immigration consequences, a whole host of reasons that present obstacles for people to report violations. And then children are also especially especially vulnerable just based on their age and lack of experience um, and deference to adults who are not their parents. Um, and so then when you have immigrant children, they're just like at really, really heightened vulnerability. And some of the worst cases that we've seen in the media in reporting in the New York Times, for example, has involved immigrant children. Um, but, you know, not all of these violations do involve immigrant children. And, you know, there was a period last summer over a five week period, there were three 16 year olds, um, 16 year old boys who were killed on the job doing hazardous work. And two of those boys were not immigrants. And, um, and they're, they're the New Jersey DC and Massachusetts AG's offices have found massive child labor violations in relation to hours at Chipotle and have found find them millions of dollars, you know, and th that again is probably like a broader range of, of minors. But I think your question about the motivations, um, you know, we have, th there's a term, the fissured workplace um, that David Weil, who headed uh, Wage and Hour enforcement over Obama came up with, which talks about when there's a lead corporation that's like the household name multinational we've all heard of, and they use a business model where they subcontract and then mm -hmm. the subcontractor uses a staffing agency. And some of the worst violations that we've seen in the meat pack packing plants, for example, or poultry processing have happened in this fish kind of fissured business model. And so I think it's a situation where the people at the top, it's not like they're necessarily super consciously setting out to say, I want to have human trafficking victims, you know, in our cleaning our slaughterhouses, but rather they're setting themselves up with a business model that allows them to deflect responsibility and just sort of cover their eyes and ears and say, I didn't know anything. So I, it's not my fault and I have no accountability. It's also why the, the, these Republican state uh, legislatures are trying to eliminate these some of these paperwork requirements uh, for these companies because they base then there's really no paper trail for some of these violations it appears and I'm I'm just I'm in shock that you know there is this kind of federal framework basically saying that children should not be able to uh, work in in jobs deemed dangerous and I'd imagine that that covers meat processing meat processing and, and meat packing and things like that but iowa um and their republican governor signed a law basically uh completely flouting that and if i'm if i'm getting the state right um from the piece saying no children can work in meat processing plants um i mean it, it, you you're the expert is that true and if so like how 
you know, how is that not in violation of federal guidelines and federal law? So that's such an interesting question. So the federal law, as we talked about at the outset, is a floor, not a ceiling. So the, every employer has to comply with the federal law. And then states are free to pass stronger laws. And many of them, most of them have. So in some of the cases when states are doing these rollbacks, in some cases, they're rolling it back, rolling back their additional state protections and, and just to the federal level. But in Iowa, as you noted, um, I don't remember if it included meatpacking, but it does allow um, teens as young as 14 to do formerly prohibited hazardous jobs in industrial laundries, um, or as young as 15 to do light assembly work, and also allows the state to waive certain restrictions on hazardous work for 16 and 17 year olds in a list of hazardous occupations. And so this does raise the question, you know, isn't the state, I, I, the way I understand this is that these employers still have to comply with state law. The state doesn't undo the federal law. So really the state, in my mind, the legislators think they're doing employers a favor by weakening the laws, but really what they're doing is putting them on a path toward violate A, endangering children, which is the most important thing, but also B, from a self-interest perspective for the employers, putting them on a path to violate federal law. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, by, you know, these employers could be thinking that they're complying with state law, but in fact, find themselves having penalties under, under federal law. But do we have, and, you know, as I read this, uh, this piece too, 16 states have one or more bills that could weaken their child labor laws. 13 are seeking to strengthen them. You cited the AGs in Massachusetts and a couple other states. Um, I don't know if I would bet uh, everything I own on it, but I would come close that those 16 states are dominated by Republican legislatures, uh, and those 13 states are dominated by Democratic legislatures, uh, which means, and I would imagine, too, that the AGs out of those states are reflective of whatever the will is. So if you've got a place like Iowa where the state law is actually subterranean to the basement of federal law. Um, and like you said, that exposes the employers to certain liability. But is there a federal apparatus? I mean, because I would imagine we have been operating for decades, for the most part, where the feds don't have to worry about anything going below the basement because everything was in a state was either at that basement or higher in terms of standards. And the state AGs they would have primary responsibility and the best, it seems to me, uh, position to assess whether those laws are being broken. But I don't, is it OSHA? Or is it the Labor Department? Who is it that would police this? And do they even have the enforcement uh, resources? Because it seems to me for decades, they haven't had to exert those resources to the extent that they would have to now in those 16 states that may have dropped their standards. So there's there's a, a whole lot of different questions sort of embedded in that one question. Um, I mean, as an initial matter, we have grossly insufficient resources to enforce our workplace laws from child labor laws to minimum wage to workplace safety and health, you know, to the laws that give workers the right to form and join unions. Really, this is just one more example of a public sector having been shrunken just totally inappropriately. So to give one example, the U.S. Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division, which enforces not only child labor laws, but also the minimum wage law, overtime, Family and Medical Leave Act, a whole bunch of laws. For the entire country at the end of 2023, they had 733 staffers for the whole country. That's 500 fewer than in the 1970s when the economy was significantly smaller. So that's just one example. OSHA is similarly grossly understaffed. At the state level, you're absolutely right. There are some states, the states that care about workers, um, that do have more robustly funded state labor departments or state AGs that take on workers' rights. But in some states, there's just like a couple of people who do wage and hour enforcement. In Florida, they don't even have a state department of labor and the state AG does nothing um, 
in relation to enforcing workers' rights. So this is another one of those situations where it's kind of like a tale of two countries in terms of the resources, you know, at the state level, the resources that are devoted to these issues. Um, in terms of where the laws are being strengthened and weakened, um, Generally, yes, it is in um, conservative states that where, where there are conservative legislatures that the laws are being um, weakened. Although I would note that Virginia, for example, um, passed a, a law, a bill this year, increasing the penalties from $1,000 to $2,000, still grossly insufficient, but double what it was, right, um, for child labor violations. And, and that was signed by the governor. And then there are some conservative states that have not, you know, you know, haven't really start, had any rollbacks um, to date, like Oklahoma, for example, um, hasn't had any movement to roll back child labor laws. Um, but overall, you're absolutely right that this is sort of playing out in somewhat of a, a partisan way. And also that the resources to enforce the law are grossly insufficient, both at the federal and state level. How did child labor laws intersect with child abuse law? Um, and or is it just strictly treated under kind of uh, worker law or labor law? That's a really interesting question. So generally, it's treated separately, although um, before my current position, um, I was the labor bureau chief in the New York AG's office, and we did bring a couple of child labor criminal prosecutions, and one of them um, did involve some um, you know, harming harming a minor, um, endangerment of a minor charges, which is different from child abuse, but still sort of along similar lines. Um, I think it's an it's an interesting question because in some places, um, conservatives have sought to um, pursue the parents um, for these violations, which um, you know, and in fact, I think one of the the step parents or parents of of a minor profiled in in the New York Times story was arrested and later deported. Um, and I, my own belief based on the years that I spent, I spent many years enforcing workers' rights laws in New York State at the AG's office in the Labor Department. Um, I believe that this is really, really dangerous policy and will drive child labor violations even more into the shadows because it will make people more fearful about um, reporting violations. You know, a lot of times, all the years I was enforcing labor laws, uh, employers often said, well, what we need is not enforcement. We need more education, right? And, you know, that is, uh, you know, I, I, I'm that's not the approach that we took in the administrations that I worked. We were very focused on aggressive enforcement, but I think in relation to parents with regard to child labor laws, the companies need enforcement, not education. The parent, the employers need enforcement. The parents need education and support. And, you know, there are one serious problem is a lot of the minors um, in the in the unaccompanied minor situation or in immigrant minors, they don't have work permits, although they might be eligible for them. And so that means that it's harder for them to get the kind of get employment with law abiding employers. So even though they do need, you know, in many cases to earn money to help support their families, there are employers and jobs that they can have if they're 14. It's just the the, the difficulty in getting a work permit makes that harder. And, and makes it yeah harder for them to get somewhere safe, I guess, and not be exploited in that instance. Uh, Terry Gerstein, director of the Wagner Labor Institute at New York University. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break, head into the uh, so-called fun half of the program you may be aware of. Mm -hmm. um, this is where I ask you, after 20 years, become a member. I just saw somebody in the IMs, well, actually, probably about an hour ago, um, uh, saying that they've been listening for two years, just became a member. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Got a uh, really nice email from somebody that I have misplaced. Uh, wait, maybe I have it right here. This made me uh, feel pretty good. Um, my name is Ryan. I live in North Alabama. I've been listening to your show since 2019. Y'all have been such a huge influence on me politically, and I can't thank y'all enough. It's proof that he was from Alabama, I guess. I uh, just got my 20th anniversary Majority Report baseball hat today, and I love it. Whoa. Keep up the good fight. Left is best. Um, I really liked, uh, Kimbrell's, uh, accent. 
Oh yeah. I, you know, when I go down, there's a there's there's a bunch of folks from like that area, Pens you know, uh the the Panhandle of Florida, I guess it is. Mm -hmm. Uh uh near Alabama. Uh SEC at the, country, uh, baby. At the at the Vegas uh uh conference. So I got used to that accent a little bit. Oh um, no, it's I mean not there's no mistake. He's from uh Alabama for sure. And I He's definitely that. from Alabama. Yeah. I mean we don't need to uh we don't have to uh we don't have to verify that. Uh, but, uh, folks, the point being, you can uh, help this show survive and thrive. Um, we don't always make the, uh, the best editorial choices in terms of what's going to grow our uh, numbers here uh, because we let the news and uh, really uh, our ideology and our, uh, our politics dictate what we're going to cover uh, and if you appreciate that and listen to the show uh, once or twice a week or more, for that matter, uh, become a member. You can go to jointhemajorityreport.com and, again, uh, help the show survive and thrive. You get the free show free of commercials. You get the fun half. You can pick up the app at Majority App and sign in as a member, and then you can IM the show. You get, um, oh, we get a special discount for uh, members at Cedar Seeds. It's springtime, folks. Cedar seeds. But just if you're listening, you can use the coupon code MAJORITY. I think that gets you 15% off. Maybe it's 20% off. 15 or 20% off at cedarseeds.com. Uh, uh, but become a member. That's our uh, biggest way of supporting this program. Emma. Oh, and also Just Coffee. Justcoffee.coop. Fair trade coffee or hot chocolate. Mm. Uh, it's a co-op. It's fair trade. Coupon code gets you 10% uh, off majority. Great coffee. Great coffee. Try it out. You can get the WTF blend, Marin's blend if you want. But, you know, ours is better. But, hmm. Emma. So uh, on ESVN, we spoke about South Carolina defeating Iowa in the uh, women's college basketball tournament. We talked a little bit about Caitlin Clark's impact on uh, the sport of basketball. The Milwaukee Bucks is alarming slide. This was ahead of the injury scare for Giannis, but it seems like he'll be OK. Still a pretty pessimistic about them. Also, Stefan Diggs going to Houston, uh, YouTube.com slash ESPN show. Uh, check out Left Reckoning. Uh, Bradley, do you know who's on Left Reckoning? Yeah, so uh, last night, um, uh, David and Matt spoke with uh, journalist Kurt Hackbarth and Jose Luis Granado Ceja, host of the Soberiana podcast, to talk about the Mexican elections and the invasion of the Mexican embassy in Ecuador. And Matt also spoke with Anthony Fantano, a.k.a. The Needle Drop on YouTube, about the recent um, developments in hip-hop beef. Uh, YouTube.com slash Left Reckoning for more or Patreon.com slash Left Reckoning to access the post game. All right, folks. 646-257-3920. Uh, we, um, we will turn on the uh, phone machine in, uh, in moments. And we will see you in the fun half. We've got a lot to talk about. We'll be right back. Three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, and I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now, and I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now, but I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. The Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. Fun hack. Matt. You. Fun hack. What is up, everyone? Fun hack. Nomi Key. You did it. Fun hack. Let's Point go, there. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Fun hack. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint everyone. I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women's... Stop talking oh, for wow. a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But dude, uh, you want to smoke this... Uh, seven, eight? Yes. Hi, it's me. Is it? Yes. Uh, is this me? Is it me? It is you. Is this me? Hello, is this me? I think it is you. Who is you? No sound. Every single freaking day.
What's on your mind? Sports. We can discuss free markets and we can discuss capitalism. Oh, I'm going to go that way. Libertarian. They're so stupid, though. Common sense says, of course. Gobbledygook. We fucking nailed him. So what's 79 plus 21? Challenge met. I'm positively quivering. I believe 96, I want to say. 857 210 35501 One half. 38. 911, for instance. $3,400. $1,900. Five, four, three trillion dollars sold. It's a zero sum game. Actually, you're making me think less. But, but let me say this. Poop. <laughs> you call it satire. Sam goes to satire. On top of it all, yeah. my favorite part about yeah. you is just like every day, all day, yeah. like everything you do. Without a doubt. Hey, buddy, we see you. <laughs> The week being weeded out, obviously. Yeah, sun's out, guns out. I, I, I don't know. But you should know. The, People the, just don't like to entertain ideas anymore. I have a question. Who cares? Our chat is enabled, wow. folks. I love it. I do love that. Look, gotta jump. I gotta be quick. I gotta jump. I'm losing it, bro. Um, Two o'clock, we're already late, and the guy's being a dick. So screw him. Um, um, Sent to a gulag? Outrageous. Like, what is wrong with you? Love you, bye. Love you. Bye-bye. We're back. Hello. It is uh, the fun half of the uh, Majority Report. Um, grand old party pooper. I live in South Carolina, and I personally...